in Mark chapter 7. We will finish uh, chapter 7. We're in this sermon uh, series called The Servant King. And we will read the text together. After reading, I would like to invite the children to come here as well. We have the time with our children. And children, I'm going to ask you questions about the text, okay? So make sure you're ready to answer. So listen carefully. Um, also, I would like to, to say we don't read the, the text just because we want to get to the sermon. Reading the Word of God is God's Word for us. Actually, this is the best part of the sermon because it's the Word of God. So I would like you to really open your mind and, and ask the Holy Spirit to speak with you as we re read the Word of God. So Mark 7, verses 31 through 37. This is the Word of God. Then he returned from the region of Tyre and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee in the region of Decapolis. And they brought to him a man who was deaf and had a speech impediment. And they begged him to lay his hands on him. And taking him aside from the crowd privately, he put his fingers into his ears and... After spitting, touch it, touched his tongue, and looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And his ears were opened, and his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. And Jesus charged them to tell no one, but the more they charged them, the more ze zealously they proclaimed it. And they were astonished beyond measure, saying, He has done all things well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. Let's pray. Lord, here we come to your word. We come to the words of life, Lord. We ask that your Holy Spirit would give us illumination to... To understand, because without your spirit, Lord, we cannot understand your living word. Help us to do that, and that our lives would be transformed. In Jesus' name, amen. Please. Children. I'll have the help of my son here. Whoops. Come here. It's okay. It's so key. Now, what problem did this man had? What did he have? He was what? No, mute. You can speak, right? But deaf. He was deaf. He could not hear. And what did Jesus do? Yes. Yes. With spittle, he touched his tongue, and he was what? Uh huh. Mm hmm. His tongue was released. Yes. Sure. Right. But what the text say is that some people brought this man to Jesus, right? Right? Yes or no? Yes. They brought him I to Jesus. Idea. We can also bring people to Jesus. Did you know that? Did you know that? Yes. Sometimes, when, for my children here, when can you eat candy? Saturday. Saturday. And sometimes you get your candy, and Maria forgot her candy. And what you tell me, Daddy, I'm going to get this candy for Maria. Right? You bring it. Maybe that's a good, not a good time to do that. Yeah. Dun -dun. Dun -dun. Put it on. 
and we bring to others what is good, the Word of God, the Gospel. We bring Jesus to them. So we can also share the Gospel with others and prepare them and bring them the Word of God. Amen? 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 Let's pray that the Lord would use us to do that. Amen. Close your eyes. Close your eyes. Lord, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. I pray that you would use each child here to bring others to you as well, Lord. Not only that they would see you, but they would be uh, used by you to proclaim the gospel to others. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. You can get Pedro. Now, if you have the back of the the back of your bulletin, you have the the points of the sermon for you to follow. I have uh, two friends. He is Brazilian and she is American. That they uh, met each other a few years ago, and in Three months after they met, they got married. That's not normal, right? Not at all. But let me add something to that. He did not speak English, and she did not speak Portuguese. <laughs> and they would communicate with a laptop and Google Translator, and they would talk. This is something very unnatural right but what's even more unnatural they are married today they have three kids and it's a miracle actually that they're able to communicate <laughs> and now he speaks english and she speaks portuguese everything's fine but that event itself it's a miracle it's not not normal at all they they both learn the language as life you know went with them and and they they uh learned to speak each other's languages. The sermon title today is called Jesus Speaks English. It's a uh, not normal sermon title, but I want to bring this uh, illustration for us, this idea that Jesus speaks our language. Jesus um, communicates with us in ways that we can understand and we can respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you Remember the purpose that Mark wrote this gospel. He is writing this gospel to encourage a group of Christians that were in Rome. And most of them were Gentiles and most of them persecuted. But he wanted to show them that Jesus is the true Son of God. Right? Jesus is the Son of God. He is, is not writing, uh, however, he's not writing a biography. Mark is writing a gospel. So a biography, you focus on the, the person's story and you tell the events that happened. But the gospel, you want to teach and to make a point. That was a type of literature that was not normal for that time. Today we understand what the gospel is. The gospel according to Mark. The gospel according to Luke, right? But at that time they did not know that. And it's, it's a series of events in Jesus' life that compelled others to see that Jesus is the true Son of God. What Jesus came to do and who Jesus is. So this is what the Gospel of Mark is about. And if you go back to chapter 1, you see in verse 14, for example, that Jesus gives a dramatic statement, right? He says, repent and believe the gospel. Repent and believe. This was especially uh, dramatic for the Jews. Because they were awaiting the Messiah. They were awaiting for uh, the coming of the kingdom. And the kingdom of God is not a location, as many would think. The kingdom of God is a rule, is a reign. It's 
and activities, something that Jesus brings when he is incarnated, the Son of God here on earth. So the reign of God is now established through Jesus Christ, through the person and the work of Jesus Christ. This is the theme of the coming of the kingdom of God that you can see in the whole scriptures. All throughout the scriptures you'll see that. The kingdom of God will come. The messianic king, the future kingdom, the awaited king that would come from the house of David. We see that in the Old Testament. Today we just studied the book of Amos in Bible school, right? We were studying this, this uh, expectation of the people of God. And some of them were waiting for the king to come in a certain way. The prophets would say that Jesus would come in a certain way. It's a current theme in the prophets. Isaiah 35, verses 5 and 6, the verse that we just read in our confession. It says that the eyes of the blind shall be open. When? When the king comes. The eyes of the blind shall be opened, the, ear, the ears of the deaf unstopped. The lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. They knew that the Messiah had the power to do that. And Jesus comes in our story that we just read, and he does exactly what the king that was awaited uh, do. One of the indications of the coming of the kingdom would be when the day would come and the eyes of the blind would be open. If they read their Bible, they would know that Jesus is that person. One commentator said that the contrast between the two fa faculties of reception, eyes and ears, and those of action, leaping and singing, they express totality. The whole being worshiping God. And Mark is here providing a record of what Jesus is doing. And as they look at this record, they understand who Jesus is. Who Jesus is. By the actions of Jesus, they know who Jesus is. So... Therefore, this, this text in Mark 7 is another illustration of the reign of God now present in the person of Jesus Christ. That's how we, we get to the first part of the text, verses 31 and 32. They brought the man to Jesus. Therefore, we must intercede so others can encounter Jesus. We see Jesus' compassion in verse 31. When he returned from the region of Tyre, Jesus, from that same region of the Capolis, the Capolis mean ten, means ten cities. Jesus, in chapter 5 of the same gospel, Jesus heals a man with a demon possession. Actually, he was possessed with a legion, right? And then they ask Jesus to go into this Pigs, 2,000. And what did the people of the Capolis do? They asked Jesus to leave. Get out of here, Jesus. They are scared of Jesus. They value more the pigs than Jesus. They value more money. They don't know what to do with Jesus. They don't actually know. They're scared, right? Before Jesus leaves this place, what does Jesus do? Jesus leaves there a missionary because Jesus loved them. And the missionary proclaims the word of God to them. But now, not only he, he sends a missionary, he, he goes back there to the same region. Jesus goes back to the place that people ask him to live. It shows his benevolence. It shows his love and his compassion. He doesn't give up on them. Jesus offers them a second chance. This is a picture of the love of God toward us. God's love is always insisting in forgiving our sins. 
He's insisting in loving the lost. Without the love of God, we could never be forgiven by our own actions. Woe to us if we did not have a second chance, right? God does not give up on us. Then in verse 32, we see the plea for the needy. Now the inhabitants of the capitalists, they believe that Jesus is powerful to heal. How do they believe that? Maybe they heard the gospel from that man. Maybe they remember what Jesus did to that man. We don't know. But do they understand this messianic promise of Isaiah 35? That the deaf would hear, the mute would sing for joy. Not only they take this man to Jesus, but they also suggest the method of healing. They ask Jesus to lay his hands on him. And let me tell you something. Jesus is sovereign to heal whoever he wants to heal, even today. And Jesus is also sovereign to decide which method he will use to heal a person. We don't get to decide that for Jesus. Jesus deals differently with each person. If I go around the room here and ask, how were you saved? Well, some would say, I heard a sermon, a very powerful sermon. And then I, I was convicted of my sins and asked God for forgiveness. Others would say, I heard a hymn on the radio. And that's how the Holy Spirit convicted me. Others might say, well, I was reading the Bible because I was curious about Jesus, and then that's how I got saved. Others will say, I was reading a Christian book, and I was convicted. Others will say, I was talking to a friend, and he was sharing the gospel to me. Others will say, um, after many years of going to church and listening and listening and repeating, I heard and I was actually, I found out that I was not saved and I needed salvation. You know, it is the work of the Holy Spirit to change our hearts. We don't decide how God will work in our lives. What we get to do is we present others to Jesus. We present others to Him. In the Bible, we see in 2 Kings, Damon, he was a, a commander in the armies of the Assyrian. And he is a, a leper. He needs healing, and he goes to Elisha. And he expects a good reception. Like a, a good politician, he expects all the pomp, all the, you know. But Elisha doesn't even come to see him. He sends his servant and, and tells him, go to the Jordan River and bathe there seven times. He's really upset with that. Don't we have better rivers in where we live, in Syria? He's complaining. But only if he submits, only when decides to do, to do and obey the way that he's healed. Remember when Jacob was complaining because he didn't know that time. Joseph asked, bring Benjamin here. I want to see Benjamin. And Jacob says, I lost Joseph, I lost Simon, now Benjamin. What are you doing to me, Lord? He thought it was a God's punishment. Actually, God was using this way to save his family and to bless his family. We don't get to choose the methods that God saves a person. However it was, they brought this man to Jesus. And let me... Let me give you an observation. We never get to know who these people were. This miracle here, it's only registered in the Gospel of Mark. It's not in the other Gospels. We don't know who were these people. Same story in chapter 2 of Mark. When four friends bring a paralytic and puts him on the ceiling and down with robes. Same thing. They brought them. 
they brought them to Jesus. There is this part of this anonymous ministry of the word. Anonymous ministry of bringing others to Jesus. In the end, we don't know who brought them. Do you know who James and Amelia were? You might not be familiar with these names. They were parents and they prayed for their son's conversion. And when his, their son was 17 years old, he was um, converted and became a missionary to China and spent more than 50 years in China. His name is Hudson Taylor. You probably know that name from uh, missions in China. But who brought that man to Jesus? Parents, by prayer, by teaching the word. We don't know their, who they were. We don't know what they did. Does that matter? No. Because even though we are unknown to others and to men, we are known to God. And that's what's important. What's important is that Jesus will be glorified. Jesus' name will be glorified through these people. We don't want to be receiving the glory of Jesus. We want to bring others to Jesus. And Jesus will work the miracle in their own lives. We must intercede for others. Have you given up praying for your son and for your daughter? And for your cousin, don't give up. Keep praying. You cannot save that person. All you can do is to bring them to the one who can. Let's keep pressing in prayer. The power of prayer. The power of intercession for others. Because we don't know how or when Jesus will do that. But He is powerful to do that. And we trust in Him. And we'll continue to do that for His glory. We're going to continue to pray for Lakeland, for, for our brothers, for our, our family members, our relatives. And we will be content of being the anonymous group of prayer people. We must be a praying congregation. We must always intercede for others. And since we know that we must intercede for others, we also come to this part. We, we get to see now Jesus' method. We see that Jesus speaks to this man's language now. Therefore, we must communicate the gospel in a language that others will understand. Very, very important to do that. Jesus' miracle is, is very, I might say, strange, uncanny miracle, right? Jesus does six things. One, Jesus took him aside. Two, Jesus touched his ears. Jesus spits and touches his tongue. Jesus sighs. Jesus prays. And then the miracle happens. Six different things. Jesus takes this man to the side. Jesus is not on a stage. Many miracle workers that we see today, many uh, charlatans or people that say that they are miracle workers, they want to bring the sick to the stage to perform in front of others. Right? Yes, we know that Jesus performed miracles in, in front of the crowd. But this specific case, he does not do that. Jesus is compassionate to this man. Jesus also makes a, a, a bridge of contact. He communicates to him. He touches his years. Years. He could have just said a word. He could have done anything, right? We see miracles that only... People touch his robe and they're they healed. Why does he have to do that? Jesus wants him to understand what's going on. He will heal his ears. He, Jesus touches him. A man that is mute 
and death is an outcast in the society. It's not valued, it's not touched. It's seen as a cursed person, unclean person. Jesus does the same with the leper. Jesus intentionally and purposely touches that person. And, and Jesus does that. This is extraordinary. Jesus shows that he cares for this man. Jesus not only cares for your physical condition, he cares for your soul, for your emotions. Jesus cares for you as a person. How can we respond as a church to that? A church is a place of fellowship, of warmth, of people that want to be hugged, embraced. We need to be that kind of people. When we have this time of greeting, we, we shake hands, we hug, we celebrate, we look a person in the eye, and we, we, with all of that, we're saying, you matter, I'm glad you're here, I'm glad that I get to fellowship with you because of Jesus Christ. There's nothing greater than what unites us today here this morning is the gospel of Jesus Christ and the fellowship and relationship that I have with you. It's only possible because of Jesus. So we become, we become the incarnation of Jesus in that sense. We become the feet and the hand of Jesus to others. Did you know that when you welcome someone into your world, into your life, you're being used by Jesus himself to do that. Matthew 25, we see an expression of that. When Jesus says, I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. Jesus, but when were you hungry? When were you thirsty? When you, get, when you did that to the little ones. When you did that to those who belong to me. You see, we can be used by God to show our care and compassion of Jesus. Then, the third action that Jesus does. He does a deep sigh. In, in ESV, we don't have the word deep sigh. In the KJV, we might. Or in IV. A deep sigh. And this word for sigh in the Greek is a groan. You find this same word, you know where? In Romans 8, when the Spirit groans for us. Jesus is saying, I feel your pain. Jesus is not indifferent to our pain. He looked up to heaven. Not only he feels our pain, but he drives the attention of that man to the one who can do that. It's in God. God's power. Jesus looks to heaven and then heals that man. Then we're reminded of Psalm 121. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. And then he says, Ephatha. It's a difficult word to, word to pronounce. It's in Aramaic. Let me tell you something. This is not a magical word. that You, you should go looking for deaf people and saying Ephatha to them. It's just a translation from the Aramaic that Mark decides to use here. It simply says, be open. Not only the, year, the years, but the whole being of that man. Jesus heals him immediately. It's an immediate and complete healing. Jesus never deceived anyone. Jesus never said, oh, you're healed. You can go home and receive your healing by faith, as we hear today, right? If you receive by faith, you'll be healed. Go home. And then if you're not healed, it's because you didn't have faith enough. How easy is that? I can be a, a miracle work in that way, right? The, the pressure is on you. Jesus did not do that. Jesus is God. Jesus is powerful to do that. There was a clear 
evidence of the healing. Why? Because he spoke clearly. He spoke clearly. Whatever problem, speech impediment he had, he was able to speak plainly at that time. I remember in 2010, I went to a conference in Sao Paulo with my wife. Uh, we were with a group of friends from church, and there was a, an American preacher there, and there was a translator in the conference. And uh, I, I already uh, spoke English at that time, so I was fluent in English at that time. I could see that the preacher was preaching something serious, and then this guy interpreting was making jokes out of what he said, and people start to laugh. And the, the, the preacher looked at him, and he, he doesn't understand what he's saying. Why are they laughing? It's, uh, it's embarrassing. Embarrassing to see. And then the next day, they found a new translator, a new guy to interpret. There was this problem in communication that he was not able to solve at the time. Jesus, when he brings the man aside and puts his ears and spits and all the, the symbols that this means, he, Jesus wants to communicate with him. Jesus wants him to understand what he's working in his life. How can we do that as a church? How can we do that to the, the people around us? We must communicate the gospel in a way that people would understand. In a way that people would not shut us off. Oh, you're just a religious guy. Jesus was intentionally in his communication. In a way that they would see that it was his work. How do we do that as church? With our programs, with our worship, with our building, with our finances, with our investment, the time that we spend with others, the way that we dress, the way that we behave. Have you considered that? Sometimes. Um, I, I, I'm going to give you my experience. I'm a Christian since I was a, a teenager. My mom brought me to church. But then I discovered the Reformed faith. And the reason I did not want to be part of a group like that was because of the bad example or the Calvinists in a cage that wants to change your mind at all costs. You know, people want to make their point and they're insisting and forcing down your throat. I didn't want to be like that. Oh, that's, that's like a legalist for me, right? And many Christians sometimes, when they talk to people that are not saved, they behave like that. Instead of gaining the person, they push them away. Maria, please sit down. You know, they push them away. They don't want to communicate. Third, verses 36 and 37. Jesus has done all things well. Therefore, we must always be impacted by the gospel. What we see in verse 36 is that Jesus charged them not to tell anyone. But that is strange. If you remember what happened in Mark chapter 5, that is strange. In Mark chapter 5, Jesus does not let the men go with him. Jesus says, stay here so you can preach to the people around you. And now that th this man is healed, Jesus says, don't tell anyone. Well, why did he change? What we know from the context here is that the time that Jesus was preaching. Jesus was in this, the, 
returning from Galilee on his way to Jerusalem. And this is where he would die, right? Jesus uh, did, want, did not want people to seek him as a miracle worker, but for what he was going to accomplish on the cross. As the son of God, he would have to pay for the sins of the world, of those who he would purchase on the cross. Now was the time for that. And most of people, most of the crowds, we saw that in his Galilean ministry, is that they wanted healing, they wanted bread, they wanted comfort, they wanted Jesus to serve them in that way, but they did not want to commit to Jesus' message. And many times Jesus was saying, I, I must go to other place in the end of chapter 1. Peter comes to Jesus, Jesus, everyone's looking for you. And Jesus says, no, I must go to the other towns and cities because I must uh, proclaim the word of God. Jesus is focused in teaching about his ministry, in teaching about what he was going to accomplish for them. And people wanted to receive the healing only for him. And then verse 37, in the CSB version, it says, they were extremely astonished. The NIV says they were overwhelmed. In our version, ESV, it says, and they were astonished beyond measured. How were they astonished? How did they respond? They said, He has done all things well. This is the time that people get to witness in a similar way that God did when He created the world in Genesis 1.31. And God saw everything that He had made, and behold, it was very good. You know, these metaphors of, of deafness and blindness, they are, they mean to our, uh, most of them mean that our lives without Christ are like that. We're blind. I was blind and now I see. What an amazing grace, right? I was lost and now I'm found. I was not able to hear the gospel and now I am able to hear the gospel. Every conversion to Christ is a miracle. We must recognize that. Dear brothers, we, we should not be the church that is showing everyone how many people we are converting every Sunday. Because it's not our work. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. Every time a person comes to Jesus, we celebrate with them. Right? Once I heard someone say, you know, Pastor, um, my mom, I'm praying for my mom because, I mean, it, it's impossible for her to be saved. I mean, if she's saved, that'll be a miracle. And I get to say, wow, well, if I am saved, anyone can be saved. If you're saved, anyone can be saved. This is the attitude. We're not saved by our works. We're saved by Jesus' work alone. Alone, you cannot do anything to save yourself. So if I am saved, well, Jesus can. Jesus can do in my family. Jesus can do that to my friends. And we're going to keep praying for that. And praying for the opportunities. And praying that we would communicate the gospel in a way that others understand. Let me be clear. We don't want to be a church that is accepted by the world. We don't want to be a church that is cool to others. We're now going to have a, a, a rock concert and have free uh, food and free stuff so people would come here and get, get more and more and more. This is not our job. That's not what we are to do, church. We want to be like Jesus. We want to we wanna bring people to Jesus with compassion and love. And we want to be 
not like the, the Pharisees saying, I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like this person. No. You know what preaching the gospel is? It's when you're a beggar and you find bread. You just tell your friend, the other beggar, hey, here's bread. That's it. You were hungry and now you found Jesus. Now you found him. What you want to do? You want to brag by the fact that you are a great person, very intelligent, very smart, that you found the bread by yourself? No. I wanted others to feast on him. And this is our goal. And his work on the cross should never be minimized. We need the gospel every Sunday. We need to be amazed by his works every time. Because it is the gospel that saved you in the first place. But it is the gospel that keeps you. The gospel keeps you in this process of sanctification. In this process in fulfilling your mission. So may the Lord help us with that. In the same way that my friend met the, his wife in three months later. They got married. It's a miracle. <laughs> Same way for us when we proclaim the gospel. If God changes the person, it's a miracle. It's only His work. It's only His glory. And we want to give Him the glory that He deserves. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You, Lord, for Your grace, for Your mercy. We thank you for your compassion towards us. We thank you, Lord, that because of the gospel, we are alive. Because of your word, Lord, because of your compassion, because you did not give up on us. Help us have the same attitude toward others. Help us to love others, Lord, for your glory. We ask you, Lord, help us become a church that is growing in that. In loving our mission more than our name. For your glory, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd like to ask you to stand. We'll sing this last song before we pray.